Welcome to worship, you faithful remnant, you. And faithful remnant that is watching and worshiping online with us today, I am glad that you are here. And I'm trying to figure out, was it too many tacos last Sunday or too much motorcycle riding last night? Um, I don't know. I'm glad that you are here today, uh, no matter how few you are. Uh, because wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Christ, Christ is there with us, and I am glad of that. Um, I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable and able, uh, and join me in our call to worship on this Mother's Day. We've come to worship God. Who knows us even better than we know ourselves? And whose love for us never ceases. This is our God. Let us worship together. Our first hymn is number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. wanted to add a special ending to our hymn today we thought we had five verses we didn't thank you terry for adjusting and playing an ending you you know sometimes you just have to make it up on the fly right well remain standing we won't make this up this has been around for a long time as we join together in this long-standing affirmation of the christian faith we know as the apostles creed I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. And welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I'm Pastor Steve Porch, and I'm glad that you are here worshiping with us today. Um, I'm looking. We have people watching from different places, worshiping with us from different places today, and we welcome you as well. Um, it is a special day in the life of the church. Um, it is a day that we, and we do things a little differently here at St. Paul. It's Mother's Day, and we say Happy Mother's Day, but because there's so much that surrounds motherhood and all that motherhood entails, and sometimes there's grief and disappointment and loss, um, we don't just celebrate the biological mothers in our midst. We celebrate all our ladies who are of adult age um, by recognizing them, and so I we hadn't done this in a couple of years because of COVID, so I get to give you a gift today. Yay, I know, I know. I have a platter of Dove chocolates. For, oh, I know, I know, I know. Um, now, you know, just in I don't, Oh, there's one. The purple one is dark chocolate with almonds. So if you have a nut allergy, don't get the purple one. Um, there's milk chocolate. There's dark chocolate. There's milk chocolate with caramel. And so all the ladies get to pick a Dove chocolate today. Thank you. You're very welcome. This may take us a minute. So if you're worshiping from home, I don't know. I don't know which one you want, Francis. Decisions, decisions, decisions. It's such an honor to be able to say thank you to all the ladies thank you. who have meant so much to us in so many ways. And I know I could get help doing this, but, you know, what else have we got to do? Listen to a sermon or something? The milk chocolate is the blue. I'm pretty sure. Yep. The blue. Not that I have sampled or tasted, because I am not doing that. I won't. Thank you. Coming over this side. Purple, purple. Dark chocolate with almonds, she says. That's what I want. Ooh. Ooh. Hello. You know what? I think I have enough for the younger ladies, too. I do. I do. You see, you got lucky coming to first service. I understand. I almost got some sugar-free, too, because that's what I'm relegated to. But Milk is blue. Milk is blue. And you're just going to close your eyes and grab, all right? That works for me. It's what you would have picked. Well, that's one of those God-led decisions, isn't it? I'm headed that way right now. Headed that way. Purple. That's what you want. All right. Now I'm going to keep these up here to protect them because I know some people might try to steal them uh, between services, Mark. Your praise team. So we'll just make sure. They will, they will, led by their infamous leader. I just want to say thank you because each of you ladies has had an impact in my life and on the life of our church, and I'm glad that uh, God has put you in our midst today. And uh, so we're going to say a prayer today, uh, a, a Mother's Day prayer um, that will end with the Lord's Prayer. It is a call and response prayer, so be watching your screen. Uh, and those places that say all, I'm going to invite you to join with me. So let's pray. 
Lord, on this day when we gather and celebrate Mother's Day, we know that it is bigger than just our moms. There have been so many who have meant so much. There have been so many who have struggled in so many ways. And there have been so many who have wanted to have children and couldn't. There have been so many who grieved the loss of their children. And we cannot, we cannot forget about all those. And so on this Mother's Day, we reach out and say thank you to all the ladies in our life. And we lift them up in prayer to you. We pray for older moms whose children are grown. Grant them joy and satisfaction for a job well done. We pray for moms experiencing changes they could not predict. Grant them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for pregnant women who will soon be moms. Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood. Grant them strength and wisdom. We pray for moms who are raising their children in poverty. Grant them relief and justice. We pray for stepmothers. Grant them patience and understanding and love. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. Grant them faith and hope. We pray for moms in marriages that are in crisis. Grant them support and insight. We pray for moms who have lost children. Grant them comfort in the resurrection of Christ. We pray for moms who gave up their children for adoption. Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for adoptive mothers. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you have provided. We pray for women who desperately want or wanted to be moms. Grant them grace to trust in you. We pray for all women who have assumed the mother's role in a child's life. Grant them joy and appreciation for others. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of their mother in this past year. Grant them comfort and hope in Christ's resurrection. Lord, we thank you for all of these who are mentioned and for all the women who have had an impact in our lives. We thank you for our mothers. And we thank you that in your care, you have rushed to us in our time of need like our mothers do. You have lifted us up and cared for us and loved us without ceasing. And so today, as we celebrate the women in our lives, we give thanks to you who have given them to us as a gift. And we do all of this through Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will um, stay seated as we sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit, number 334.
sweet heavenly dove. Sweet heavenly dove that I hadn't had in like a long time. Sweet heavenly dove. <sighs> well, I'm glad that you are here this morning. Let's go to God in prayer as we prepare for this time together. Lord, as we look to your word and hear your story and open ourselves to it, may you inspire in us, instill in us faithfulness, loyalty, commitment, and dedication to each other and to you. And all of this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to be reading first from the message uh, from the book of Ruth. And I'll be reading chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Boaz married Ruth. She became his wife. Boaz slept with her. By God's gracious gift, she conceived and had a son. The town women said to Naomi, Blessed be God. He didn't leave you without family to carry on your life. May this baby grow up to be famous in Israel. He'll make you young again. He'll take care of you in old age. And this daughter-in-law who has brought him into the world and loves you so much, why, she's worth more to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and held him in her arms, cuddling him, cooing over him, waiting on him hand and foot. The neighborhood women started calling him Naomi's baby boy. But his real name was Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I know this is probably going to be a little bit of a stretch of a question, but... How many of you have ever seen the movie with Ben Stiller called Meet the Parents? A few of you, a few of you might want to admit it. It's a funny, funny movie, and in it, Stiller plays this young Jewish man who goes to meet the overbearing, overprotective, super inquisitive parents of his soon-to-be, or at least he hopes, fiance, none of whom are Jewish. What transpires is a series of hilarious and chaotic events as the unrelenting, unforgiving ex-CIA father-in-law-to-be played by Robert De Niro tries everything possible to rid his family of this unwanted guest. Kind of like squirrels in the attic. They're still there, though. This unwanted guest who would never, never be good enough for daddy's little girl. And while it's just a movie, it's so typical of the relationships and the stories that we expect to hear about in-laws, right? No offense to my new in-law family, the Nixons, wherever they might be, but it's what we expect from in-laws. And I know it's Mother's Day and we're supposed to be being nice, but... But, but who in here would admit to having a perfect relationship with your in-laws? Perfect. I mean perfect. That everything is always peachy keen. There's never been a problem. Go ahead. Raise your hand if you can admit that it's been perfect. Wayne Smith. Wayne. That's coming from Wayne, who learned from Gerald Holloway. So I'm not sure that can be trusted. I mean, let's face it, we, we joke about in-laws, we kid about in-laws, we laugh about in-laws, but in reality, in-law relationships can sometimes get messy, can't they? Maybe that's one of the reasons that this story of Ruth, who is a, a Moabite widow and the daughter, daughter-in-law of an Israelite woman, caught the attention of the Israel, Israelite people. Because it defied the odds, it went against the norm, it set a new standard, if you will, on what it meant to be faithful and loyal and committed, especially to a mother-in-law to whom this, th that this woman had no moral or legal obligations to anymore. Ruth exhibited what in Hebrew is called kesed. Kesed. You, you say that with me, kesed. 
and really it has kind of a little H guttural sound in the Q. It's kind of chesed, but I'm not going to try to get you to say it that way because I can barely say it that way. But chesed means a deep sense of faithfulness or loyalty arising out of commitment to another. The five verses of Scripture that we read um, just a moment ago consist of the climax, if you will, the culmination of this beautiful story of a daughter-in-law's extraordinary cassette love for her widowed and sonless mother-in-law. Naomi, whose name means pleasant, and names are really important in this story. We're going to talk about the meaning of the names in this story. Um, Naomi, whose name means pleasant, had big plans, big dreams, big hopes for her budding family. But, but a famine came in the land of Judah and sent them packing to a foreign country. They went all the way to that dreaded country of Moab. Now, being the good wife that she was, she grabbed up her two boys, Milan, whose name means sickness, and Kilion, whose name meant spent, and she followed her husband, Elimelech, whose name means, my God is king. you got to like a name like that. My God is king. And she followed them, him to this faraway land to live. And in kind of a story similar to Job, while they were there, Elimelech died. And her two boys, all she had left, married two foreign women. See, that wasn't a thing back then you didn't marry foreign women and it was not the big dreams that she had for her boys and then her boys sickness and spent died they got sick and died hence the name sickness and spent and in a time when it wasn't easy to be a woman anyway here was Naomi stranded in a foreign land with no husband no sons no nothing except for a couple of foreign daughter-in-laws. Ugh! Orpah and Ruth. And they too now were widows. In a culture that honored male lineage and wealth and property were tied to male ownership, you could say that Naomi lost virtually everything, except some excess baggage called in-laws. It's no surprise that as soon as she learns that there is food back home in Judah, she, she hits the road with baggage in tow, but Naomi knows there is nothing there for her daughter-in-laws where she is headed. They are no longer obligated to stay with her. She has no other sons for them to marry according to the Israelite laws and customs, and she's way too old to get married again, ha have children herself for sons for them to marry some 20 years down the road. So Naomi gives them their walking papers, urging them to go back to their parents and remarry in their home country and have children there and raise them so that their lives will not have to be bitter like hers has become. Daughter number one, Orpah, whose name means the back of the neck, turns her head away, turns her back to, so that uh, Naomi sees the back of her neck, and walks away, heads back home to her family. But Ruth, Ruth, whose name means friend or companion, isn't it amazing how these names just fit this story so well? They were just wise back then, right? Huh. Ruth, whose name means friend or companion, it says she clings to, to, to Naomi, clings to her. And the Hebrew ver verb used there is the very same verb that is used way back in Genesis when it says that a woman shall leave her home and cling to her husband. Now, I don't know how many of you might recall in this story uh, uh, Ruth's statement of loyalty to Naomi, but, but it, it's, it goes along these lines. She says, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me go home. Before, because where you go, I go, and where you live, I'll live. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I'll die. And that's where I'll be buried, so help me God. Not even death itself is going to come between us. 
Now that's devotion, right? From an in-law to her mother-in-law. A foreign in-law to her Israelite mother-in-law. Can you say wow to that? Well, Naomi sees that she's not going to win the argument, so she, you know what she does? She just quits talking to Ruth altogether. Not going to argue with you, I just won't talk to you. And she heads on home to Bethlehem. And as they entered the town together, people began to ask, Naomi, is that you? Naomi? And she said, yes, it is me, but I am no longer Naomi because I'm no longer pleasant. Don't call me by Naomi because now I am very bitter, so call me Mara. Mara. Because I left here full and I'm returning empty-handed. The Lord has taken everything away from me. Everything away from me. Now imagine yourself standing right next to her as Ruth. What a crushing blow that must have been. Because you're standing there waiting to be introduced to her, uh, to, to these, new, these, these new people as the loyal daughter-in-law who followed me from Moab all the way back because she loves me. And instead, she says, the Lord took everything away from me. I'm bitter. I've got nothing. I, I might go ahead and go back to Moab. But this does not deter the faithfulness of Ruth who works hard to provide what she can for Naomi. She volunteers to go out to the fields to glean what is left after the harvest to pick up the leftovers along with all the other widows and orphans. And here's a young woman who, according to custom, could have and probably should have been out finding a husband in her home country and having kids and raising a family and yet she's willing to take on the role of a servant widow for the sake of her dead husband's mother. And it just so happens that she makes it out to the field of one of Elimelech's, remember Elimelech, my God is king, married to, to Naomi before he died, one of Elimelech's relatives named Boaz. Here you go, you ready for Boaz's meaning? In him is strength. So when you see Boaz, you know that's one strong guy. And not just strong guy, but strong guy. In him is strength. Now when Boaz comes to the field to check on the workers there, something or someone catches his eye. A new person gleaning out in the field with the reapers. And he goes, who is that? <laughs> Where does she come from? And they say, oh, her? Her, that's the devoted Moabite who came back with Naomi. I'm sorry, Mara. You see, the story of Ruth's loyalty, despite Mara never saying anything really about it, was already circulating around the town. And while it may have been her looks that originally attracted him, now Boaz's intrigue is based on something a little different. I mean, here's a woman who had exhib exhibited an exceptional quality, a level of loyalty, a level of faithfulness, a level of commitment, a kesed that far exceeded anything he had ever witnessed before. And maybe it was because he was Naomi's relative and he wanted to see Naomi taken care of, or maybe he had ulterior motives, but whatever the case, Boaz decided he would take care of Ruth by giving her some special privileges in the field and sending her home with extra food. And, and so it went until the end of the harvest, and, and Ruth gleaned the fields, received special gifts from Boaz, and lived and took care of and supported her mother-in-law. Now, if you remember any part of this story, it's probably the part that happens next. Naomi, in what appears to be concern for Ruth, but really could easily be taken as a move to secure her own family lineage, sends her daughter-in-law to have a clandestine rendezvous with Boaz in the middle of the night on the threshing floor. You can take that for all the innuendo it's worth. And Ruth's next act of loyalty begins when she says, okay, and she takes a bath. And she gets all dolled up and puts on her makeup. And she puts on 
uh, her finest clothes. And in the middle of the night, she slips in beside Boaz on the threshing floor as he goes to sleep, as he's sleeping. And the rest, as they say, is history. We don't know what happened. It's not written, but we got some good guesses. And Ruth goes back to Naomi in the early hours of the morning, and Boaz's life changed. He wheels and deals with another relative in front of the elders of the city to get the right to redeem the land and the property of his relative Elimelech, which just so happens to include Ruth. If he bargained to redeem that property, Elimelech's property, it just so happened he'd get Ruth. What, a, what an amazing thing. What a coincidence. And can't you just hear him bargaining with his uncle, his relative, who, who had the rights to redeem the property? He said, now, now here's the deal. Unc, my favorite uncle, my favorite uncle, I'm trying to take care of you here because this is actually your property to redeem because you're a closer relative to Elimelech than I am. But, but, but if you do it, I just want you to know, if you do it, you don't just get the property, you also get the responsibility of taking care of not one, but two widows, and one of those is from Moab. Ugh! You don't want that, right? And with that ploy, Boaz wins the right to redeem the property and marry Ruth and maintain the family heritage as Ruth and Boaz have this little boy named Obed, father of Jesse, father of David. Naomi, who had returned home in her words empty-handed, is now blessed by a full house. But as important as that little boy was, an ancestor to a future king, the women of the town were not praising her because of the boy, for they saw the same thing that Boaz had seen. Here was a gift that was better than even seven sons. Now, you've got to understand, Seven sons in that day was rich. You had a wealth if you had seven sons. And daughters were not worth much. And they said, here is something better than seven sons. Here is a daughter-in-law. That's even lower down than a daughter. Here's a daughter-in-law who loves you. It's the only time in the whole book that the word love is used. Here's a daughter-in-law that loves you, and that's better than seven sons. Because here is Ruth, the example of faithfulness and loyalty and commitment and kesed, and she loves you. Even when you tried to send her away, even, when, even enough to, to leave her home and family and cling to you, even when you didn't realize what she was doing for you, even enough to become a widow for you and stay a widow for you, even enough to break the rules and the laws and the customs of your people, to sneak in and lie with a man who wasn't her husband for you, and now enough to bear a son so that your heritage, your heritage might be maintained and your life restored. She loves you with an undying loyalty. Kesed. And now on this Mother's Day, it would be easy to just walk out of here with this message that, that we are to love our mothers and our mothers-in-law and, and those who have been like mothers to us with that same kind of kesed that, that Ruth sh showed to Naomi. And, and that's a good message indeed. But I believe there's more to this story of Ruth than that. For the story of Ruth is not just about our loyalty to each other. It's really an analogy of the kesed of God toward us. You see, Naomi was the Israelites, pleasant and happy when things went their way, and bitter and angry when they didn't. So upset about the things that had gone bad that they didn't see the gift that God, that, that God was giving them. Not that we would ever be like that, right? But Naomi really is you and me. And Ruth, well, she plays the part of this faithful and loving God. 
Uh, for you see, this story is not as much about husbands and wives and inheritance and property as it is about a loving God who shows faithful, faithfulness and loyalty through everything. Yes, God in this story, which God's not brought up in this story, but God in this story is a Moabite widow, a foreign daughter-in-law. The last person that you would ever expect to be the model of God. But that's who God is. The one who gives everything for the sake of her in-law family. God's the one who's given all for us. And so, so we can go forth and honor our mothers and our fathers and our brothers and our sisters and our neighbors and even our in-laws. The Nixons will be happy to hear that. Because we have and we know a God who has demonstrated that kind of kessed love for us. We have a God who is faithfully and loyal committed, loyally committed to us. Even when we turn away, even when we push God away, even when we don't recognize God's presence and God's gifts, even when it seems like life has treated us unfairly and we become bitter and resentful and angry, even when any excuse. And because of that, we are blessed with a gift that is greater than even seven sons. Whew, I could barely deal with one. And we are blessed because we have a God who loves us like Ruth. We have an in-law, God. And I'm glad. Let's pray. Lord, today we celebrate your faithfulness, your loyalty, your commitment, your dedication, and the lengths to which you went to redeem us. Kind of like Boaz. Boaz would do anything to be the redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. And you, you have done everything to be our redeemer in Jesus Christ. And so in the knowledge and the assurance of your commitment, your kessed love, we are able to go forth in your name and share that commitment and loyalty with those around us. So that they might know who you are. And might come to believe in your son Jesus. And all of this I pray in his holy and precious name. Amen. And amen. And as we talk about God's faithfulness, we'll close our uh, service today with the hymn number 140, which is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I invite you to stand as you are able as we do so.
may be seated. For those who have worshipped with us online today, I pray that you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Uh, may any struggle that you have be comforted by God's presence and by surrounding you with His love and the love of those around you. Uh, and may your joys be manifold and magnified. And may you give praise to God this week and all the weeks to come. Thank you for being with us. Amen.